Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Rachel Kramer. I'm the director of the Popular Music Conservatory here at Orange County School of the Arts. It's such a pleasure to have all of you with us. Today's event is part of our fifth annual Master Artist Series. This series brings acclaimed artists and industry professionals to OSHA to work with our talented students, building their skills and providing inspiration and guidance for their futures. This year, we have an impressive list of visiting guest artists, including Academy Award-winning costume designer, Ruth E. Carter, trailblazing ballerina, Misty Copeland, and Academy Award-winning screenwriter, Kevin Wilmont. We're deeply grateful to our sponsors, um, who is, some of them are anonymous. We have Kent and Brandy Barkeras, the Bushala family, Farmers and Merchants Bank, the JE Foundation, Deb and Aaron Malo, the Macbeth Foundation, Maureen and Michael Met, uh, Mekjen, and the Sum Sumbasakis family, the Yamaha and Charlie and uh, Ling Zhang. We'd like to extend a very special welcome to the Bushala family who are in the audience today. Um, it's been due to their continued support of OSHA and incredible generosity that this special experience has been made possible. In particular, I want to give a huge shout out to a popular music conservatory alumnus and friend, Albert Bushala, who's with us today. He's been collaborating with our foundation team and me on making this year's Master Artist Series a great success. Um, Albert's passion for music, his networking, um, and uh, love for our conservatory has helped us make our connections with so many of the artists and arts leaders we've hosted this semester. Um, Albert, we're so grateful for your help, your leadership, and your partnership. It's with uh, your help and your passion that our conservatory has continued to serve its mission, even in this weird virtual environment that we're a part of right now. We'd also like to express our continued gratitude for the special OSHA supporters joining us today. Um, we're so glad to have you all with us and appreciate your continued dedication to our school. Today, we are so excited to introduce internationally acclaimed musician, producer, and Executive Education Director of the Grammy Museum Foundation, David Sears. Mr. Sears has been composing and arranging music for over 30 years with some of the most notable industry names, including The Temptations, David Foster, and Harry Belafonte. Other activities in his diverse musical career have included teaching for over 20 years as a high school music educator, conducting in production, and performing across many mediums, including tours, television, movies, and recordings. We are extremely lucky to have Mr. David Sears with us today for a moderated career discussion, led by myself to chat about Mr. Sears' professional background, the skill set needed to be successful in a career in music, and student opportunities with Grammy Camp. Mr. Sears will be starting off with an introduction, followed by a short PowerPoint presentation, and then end the session with a Q&A. Students in the room, many of our seniors have prepared a question for Mr. Sears, but we might have time for more. So please be submitting your questions for Mr. Sears throughout the masterclass via the Zoom chat function. Um, we're so looking forward to today's program and we hope you enjoy. Everyone, please help me in giving a warm Zoom welcome to Mr. David Sears. Well, hello and thank you. Hi, everybody. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'd love, David, to just have you start off by uh, telling us a little bit more about your background. Um, and then I know you have an amazing little presentation for us as well. Okay. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I've been on the planet for a long time, so I don't want to take too long with the background. But I've, I've, I've been very fortunate to have um, been able to work with some amazing artists and amazing music professionals. Uh, and I uh, grew up in Los Angeles, went to school in Los Angeles, went to college in Los Angeles. And it seems like I've been in Southern California all my life. And uh, other than vacations, uh, the only times I seem to be out of California is, is when I would go on the road with someone uh, or that type of thing. I, was, uh, I went to college, not as a music major. I went to college as an electrical engineering major. I had my whole life planned out for me. I was going to uh, have, have a career in electrical engineering after I retired from professional baseball. That was my plan. Um, there was a major league franchise that I was fortunate enough to have interest, to be interested in me while I was in high school. And so my plan was to sign with them after I graduated from college. 
all of that changed when I went to college. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, why that changed you know, a little later on, but uh, discovered another passion of mine, which was music, became a music major, found in that that I was um, passionate about not only playing my instrument, but I was passionate about composition and about education. And so I tried to figure out a way to use all of those at the same time. Uh, after I graduated, I got a job teaching at the high school level. That's where I wanted to do. And, uh, but I wanted to be near uh, the recording studios where at the time, most of the commercial recording studios in Los Angeles were in Hollywood. So I applied and got a job at a school, at a high school that was uh, near the Hollywood studios so that after teaching, I could go and do the late afternoon session or the evening session. Um, and I did that for quite some time. Um, so I taught at a you know, regular neighborhood high school for uh, 17 years. And then I and uh, uh, maybe two or three other teachers who had distinguished themselves in the district uh, were asked to uh, start a magnet school that was a music magnet as the district did not have a music magnet. Uh, we, we did that and uh, we, we, we actually were sitting in a drum and bugle corps show when we were, we sort of mapped out what we would like the district to do. I didn't, I was, the, I'm the cynic. So I didn't have much confidence that the district would give us what we wanted. But as it turned out, all the stars lined up and the district was, you know, 100% behind us and they gave us pretty much everything that we asked for. Um, and the following year, uh, Hamilton High School Academy of Music opened in 1987 and I taught my last seven years there before moving on to the Recording Academy. Because I was also a recording musician, uh, I was a member of the Recording Academy and, and, and at Hamilton became the liaison between the school and the industry because I was I was the one guy on the music staff who was still, you know, playing professionally and writing, in 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 the business. Um, from there, I moved to to got the opportunity to move to the, the recording academy to uh, work in the education programs in the fairly new uh, at the time Naris Foundation, later becoming the Grammy Foundation, and I've been there ever since. Wow, incredible. Um, yeah, that's really inspiring. And especially for a lot of our students out there, David, um, a lot of them think that they're not gonna pursue music as their main career. Some of them wanna pursue medicine, psychology. So it's just so interesting that you actually had this set plan in your head and it just completely shifted and it came focused around music, around still performing. Uh, so it's just wonderful. Yeah. yeah, it did. I mean, you know, I have, I have three kids, uh, two of them, are in the arts and one of them uh, is a lover of the arts and she she is she is a, a great audience member <laughs> but um and they uh the, the the two boys were kind of like me in in a way they they thought they were going one way and ended up going another way uh the one who's not in the arts told us what she wanted to do when she was 11 years old. And now she's 33 and that's what she's doing. <laughs> she never changed her mind. She was incredibly focused. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Well, hey, I know you have a little presentation for us. Um, Mr. Hammy, would you wanna get that PowerPoint going and let's get started. I know you have a lot of great wisdom and advice to give our young artists here. Yeah, I don't know how great it is, but I have lots of advice. I have, I have, <laughs> I have opinions about everything. Trust me, I'm looking, I'm looking here, and I'm seeing a lot of people getting out pen and paper. They're, yeah. they're ready to write some notes down. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So there's, there's a caveat about questions you can ask me, uh, and that caveat is, you can ask me anything that you like. Nothing is out of bounds. If I think it is, I'll just say, hey, I'm glad you asked the question, but that's not what I'm going to answer. But you can ask anything. You can ask me how many toes I have on each foot. You can ask me, you know, well, I already told you how many kids I have. You can ask me 
how old they are. You can ask me anything that you like. And the reason I do that is because I was extremely shy when I was in high school and middle school and, uh, and had a lot of questions, but didn't ask them and, and came to learn, you know, years later uh, and, and then, you know, many years of working with students that sometimes the most innocuous question is a question that can help you to formulate what you're really going to get you on a path to, to formulating what you really want to do in life. So whenever I do these panels, when I do them across the country, I mean, before COVID hit and we're, you know, I get on airplanes and go places, I always let the students know you can, you can ask whatever you want. Uh, I'm not going to get angry with you as long as you respect the fact that, you know, if you ask a question that's a little bit too personal, I say, yeah, I'm going to pass on that one. But uh, please, that, that's kind of the way uh, I, I like to do it. So you see here, it says careers through music. So, uh, or it's going to be uh, six questions a young person should ask himself or herself when considering life as a professional. Uh, part of this series will discuss why and many other things. But the first question that many people tend to ask when we do this is, uh, we, we used to have a program, well, we still have a program called Grammy Career Day. And we used to say careers in music. And then about four or five years ago, I changed it to careers through music because I had this epiphany. And what, what, what we mean by that, by saying careers through music, is the discipline that you students are learning now or have learned when you're in your high school music classes, particularly in your ensemble classes, those disciplines will be helpful to you regardless of the career that you go into. Uh, I mentioned my, you know, one, my, my youngest who told us what she wanted to be when she was 11. She said she wanted to be a lawyer when she was 11. And then my wife and I waited for her to change her mind and she never did. Uh, I can tell you that the music lessons that she got and the music instruction that she got was beneficial to her in becoming a successful attorney, which is what she is today. Um, and you know, I've had students who have gone on to other careers and have come back and say, look, what I learned playing in the band or playing in the orchestra or singing in the choir was beneficial to me in, in certain name of career here. So those, those disciplines, that's, that's why we say careers through music instead of careers in music, because it's not just about a career in music. So why don't we just go right on to the next slide? Okay, or seven key components for professional success in any career, okay? Um, so you already know a little bit about my background. I've, I've had the opportunity to work with a bunch of different people uh, many of whom you'll have to ask your grandparents who they are. Um, so, you know, when you go home, ask, ask your grand, ask your mom, well, not, not your mom, but ask your grandparent if they've heard of Danny Kaye or, or, or Lena Horn, and they'll probably know who those people are. But I've, I've been very, very fortunate in my career and uh, sometimes kind of in spite of the crazy things that I was doing that wasn't very intentional. Uh, a lot of gigs just kind of dropped in my lap. Uh, the, the, the two that I mentioned, well, the Danny Kay gig didn't drop in my lap, but the Lena Horn gig definitely just kind of dropped in my lap. And what we want to do, frankly, is to try to avoid that by creating plans that help us to uh, be more intentional, to give us a better chance of having success. So there, you know, the, the more intentional you are, the better your plan is, the less you have to depend on luck. Okay, uh, next slide. What do you wanna do professionally? That's the first thing you need to think about. You know, what is it that you want to do? I told you earlier, you know, I wanted to be an electrical engineer after retiring from professional baseball. When I was in the 11th grade, I was offered a contract by a major league franchise to play minor league ball. So I figured, okay, that's what, that's what I'm going to be doing until I'm 30 something when I retire from baseball. Um, so I had an idea of what I wanted to do. I def had a definite idea of what I wanted to do, but also you need to understand that sometimes that may change. 
Let's go to the next slide. That's a big one. Why do you want to do this? Uh, I mentioned that, you know, I wanted to be an electrical engineer after retiring from baseball. I think the reason I said electrical engineering was because my dad was an electrician and my dad as an electrician, he worked in the aerospace industry and he was able to work in a really cool area of the aerospace industry that I thought was the coolest thing in the world, which is why I couldn't understand why he quit working there to become an entrepreneur, uh, which later on became the, one of the better, best professional decisions he ever made. But my dad was an electrician and he worked with uh, at Lockheed Aircraft and his last position at Lockheed was in their development department called Skunk Works. Uh, Skunk Works is, is, the, is the place that developed airplanes such as the U-2 and the SR-71, the fastest air breathing um, uh, airplane still today. And uh, my dad worked on that project. That was the last project he worked on. And it was so secret that he couldn't even tell me it was an airplane. All they could say was the article. Years and years later, he could tell us a little bit more about it. But uh, there were things that he knew about it that he could not tell me and did not tell me even, you know, he's gone now, but, you know, never was able to tell me. But I thought that was really cool. But that was a wrong reason for me to say I wanted to be an electrical engineer, you know, because my parents thought it would be cool. You know, uh, a good reason is because you have a passion for it and you have the skill for it, or you have the the wherewithal and the ability to build up your skills for that. Let's go to the next slide. How? Very important. Because now we get to what I call the activation. You're all in high school, I guess, or they're all in high school, right? Yes, they're all in high school. In high school, we're in the I'm gonna phase. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to be a, I'm going to be the next uh, fill in the blank. I'm going to be the next uh, 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 big movie star. I'm going to be the next big time musician. I'm going to be the next uh, uh, Bill Gates. I'm, go I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. Everything is aspirational. It's now start, it's time to start thinking about the activation. How are you going to accomplish this? Having goals is great. Having a vision is great. Having a goal without a plan is a recipe for failure. So you need to start, if you haven't already started, well, actually you guys have because you're, you're studying there at school, but how do you connect what you're doing now to what you wanna do? That's, that's, that's very important. So it's time to start constructing a plan that's going to give you the best chance at a having a successful career in the field that you want to be in. So how is very, very important. Doing that also requires you to take a very hard and honest look at yourself and your own abilities. Uh, yes, I was offered a contract to play baseball when I was in the 11th grade. When I got to college and looked around at the ball players that were playing there. And in those days, freshmen couldn't play varsity ball. So you had to play freshman ball. My coach liked me and he liked me because you know I worked really hard. And that was the reason I, I kind of stood out when I was a junior in high school. I just outworked everyone. And, that, and then I was able to overcome those talent things that I did not necessarily have that others had. When I got to college, everyone was working as hard as I was. And a lot of them, most of them had more talent than me. So I had to come to some hard realities about myself to make, okay, as much passion as I have for playing this, will I in fact be able to get to the major leagues and play major league ball? And so you have to really be honest with yourself about that. Uh, and what I did is I, I looked at the team that was interested in me and I played three positions on the baseball field, left field, center field, and first base. I'm left-handed, so you know, that's, you're limited in the number of positions you can play defensively. I looked at the three people who were playing those positions at that time when I was a freshman in college, 
And all of those people are currently in the Hall of Fame. I figured at that time, you know what? I am never going to break into that lineup. That's the only franchise that's interested in me right now. So maybe I better think about something else. And then I remembered something that my, my music teacher told me when I was in high school. He says, you know what? You'd make a really good music teacher one day. I thought about that. I realized I had a passion for music. And next thing I knew I was a music major. But the, 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 what you the takeaway from all of that is being honest with yourself about your abilities and not only you know, this, you know, how you're gonna build your skill sets, but are you willing to take, you know, to work as much as it's going to take in order to give yourself the best chance of success. Next slide. Win. Okay, that's good. Um, when I was in college, I always use myself as an example because I did a lot of the quote unquote wrong things. <laughs> Uh, now I'm a music major and I'm in college. I start getting into that. I, I, I figure out I also have a passion for writing. I started writing when I was in college, um, was encouraged to do so by, by one of my instructors. And a lot of the music that I wrote initially to many folks sounded like film scores. So they said, you know what, David, you ought to become a film scorer. And I says, you know, that would really be cool. I think I'll write music for movies. And then, but because I didn't have a plan, frankly, that never happened. But what does that have to do with when? It's important for you to establish benchmarks. So you have your plan. So having a plan and executing a plan is one thing, but establish benchmarks so that you know where you are along the way. Okay, in six months, where am I going to be on this plan? Do I need to make an adjustment with the plan? So. That, that keeps you more actively involved in moving ahead and moving forward. And it also helps to keep you focused so that you don't become too scattered in what you're doing. Um, that's, that's, the win is very important. And the next one is also important, next slide, because no one makes it alone. Who? It is important that you have a really good professional network of folks to help you on your road to success. No one does it all by themselves. And where do you start? Now, if we were all together in a room and COVID wasn't happening, I would say, look at the person on your left, look at the person on your right, that's where you start if you haven't already started to build that because you don't know who these folks are going to be in five years or in six months maybe. I went to high school with a guy named Billy Preston and even then we knew that Billy Preston was probably a big deal. I didn't really, you know, didn't really get too involved with Billy in terms of uh, becoming, have, bringing him into my network. And part of that was because when I was in high school, I didn't intend to be in the music business. But when I got in college, I did intend to be in the music business and I didn't look Billy up. So what happens to Billy Preston? Billy Preston goes off and when you listen to all those Beatles records that have piano parts on them, that's Billy Preston playing those parts. There were other people who've had very successful careers in music that I went to high school with. The, the, former, um, the former principal cellist for the Utah Symphony uh, also played trombone. He sat right next to me in the band for three years. We were right next to each other. He was always a chair lower to me, but he was the principal cellist in the, in the orchestra. Trombone was his second instrument. Um, and we, we you know, I didn't really connect with him after we left high school. And, and I could go on because there were four or five other people who were in high school at the same time that I was, who went on to have and are having really successful careers in music. And I didn't connect with them. So the who is very important. Make those connections. 
by not connecting with them early on, it inhibited my career growth. When I did connect, uh, things started to happen. I see someone says, I love Billy Preston. <laughs> All right, next. Now, will, a lot of people think this, when they see this, they say, well, does that mean you have the will to do it and all of that? And that's not really what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, will this contribute to your happiness? Is this something that you really want to do? Is this something that you would do for free? Um, those are questions you need to ask yourself. And if it will contribute to your happiness, then you're probably on the right track. And remember, happiness is not something that happens to you. You have to go out and decide to be happy and then put yourself in a position where it feels like that. Okay, think about that. Think about that. Uh, I don't work for a school district anymore. So there are things that I can say that perhaps other people in school districts can't say. Girls have friends who are boys. That's different from having boyfriends. Have friends who are boys, you're teenagers. It is highly unlikely that your boyfriend is gonna be the person that you marry. Uh, very few people marry their high school sweetheart and stay married for a long time. So. That's, I used to tell that to my daughter all the time, you know, have friends who are boys, have friends who are boys. Okay, let's move on. This is pretty obvious. Uh, how hard are you willing to work? Are you willing to work at this hours? When I became a music major, I was not prepared to be a music major. I went, I would, I played in the band, I played in the orchestra, but remember, my focus was academics, particularly on the science and and, and math side, and playing baseball. I was just doing music because it was just something else to do and it was fun. So I never took music theory in high school. I never took music history in high school. You know, th there were basic things. I mean, I played my horn pretty well. But there are basic things I didn't know. I didn't know anything about the overtone series. I didn't know that it ex that it existed. You know, I didn't know what Pythagoras had to do with major scales and stuff like that. I knew none of that stuff. I had to learn all that stuff in college. So when I got to college and changed my major to music as a freshman, I was behind everyone. I mean, everyone. Um, and I had to catch up. And so I had to ask myself, am I willing to work that hard to catch up? Uh, and I didn't really ask myself that. I should have. I didn't ask myself that. But as it happened, something dropped in my lap. There was a guy who was in the trombone section with me. And he's, uh, he, I thought that he was a junior. In, in the band. I thought he was a junior in college. And I was a freshman. Because I would get in the band and I'm looking, OK, I can't be last chair forever. So by the time I graduate, I want to be principal trombone in the wind ensemble. So who do I have to beat out? Okay, I don't have to worry about him because he's graduating in, 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 in June, so he'll be gone. So we'll look at the next guy and I said, and I looked at this guy and I said, and it was something about this guy that I did not like. I don't know why I didn't like him. He was a nice guy. I had no reason for not liking him. And when we were always nice to each other, we never argued or anything like that, but it was something about him that rubbed me completely the wrong way. But I thought he was a junior. I says, okay, well, I can put up with him for a couple more years until he graduates and he's gone. And so one day we were talking and I asked him what year what he was. And he said, I'm a freshman. And he was a freshman. I says, I cannot be second chair to this guy for four years. It'll drive me crazy. So I started practicing my horn and I would practice four or five hours a day. Um, and uh, I, I, after making an initial misstep by not paying attention to what one of my mentors, Vernon Leidick was telling me when he said, take lessons from Fred Fox. Fred Fox is a French horn player. I play trombone. He says, why should I take lessons from Fred Fox? He's a French horn player. I should take lessons from Roy Main, who was one of the top trombone instructors in 
California, if not the Western United States at the time. And he was teaching at the school where I went. And he says, Roy is great, but Roy is not who you need. You need to talk, you need to take lessons from Fred Fox. Well, I had learned from a previous bad decision by not listening to Vernon Leidig that I probably should listen to him this time. Best decision that I made in college was listening to Vernon Leidig when he said, take lessons from Fred Fox, because it turned my whole life around in terms of how I approached my instruments and how I played musically, how I learned about the science of music, how I learned about the science of playing my horn, all of that. It completely changed my life with regards to that, it helped me figure out what I was hearing when I was listening to other people play. It, it, was, it was one of the most impactful experiences I had musically while I was in college. So, uh, and he used to frankly kind of verbally kick me in the butt a lot about, you know, you gotta work harder at it. So how, how hard are you willing to work? That's very important. Next slide, please. These are all skill sets that you are going to need to have to give you the best chance at being successful in music. And these are all skill sets that you are kind of learning by osmosis just by being in ensemble classes in school right now. So that's important. And it's just to point out how, how, how important it is to have these types of ensemble classes. Learning how to get along with others is very important. I spent probably half of my playing career in rhythm sections, playing keyboards. I mean, see, I'm surrounded by keyboards here. Um, when you're in a rhythm section, it's, the rhythm section never clicks if the guys in the rhythm section don't like each other. You have to be able to put that aside and, and work together as a team. So um, you are learning all those skills. Be aware that you are, because if you're aware that you are, then you can continue to build on them and hone them and, and get them even better. Okay, I think we're going to stop there and go right into questions if we can. We don't, we don't need to go into the book or the other thing. Thank you. All right, who's the first one that's going to ask me how many toes I have on each foot? <laughs> Let me see. Um, I think I'm going to start with a senior. I'm actually going to ask a question for a senior first. Okay. Um, so we have an amazing senior bassist. Her name's Angie. Um, and she wanted me to ask you about your experience working with Esperanza Spalding. <laughs> okay. uh, I got a chance to work with Esperanza the year she was nominated for Best New Artist for Grammy. Uh, we used to have a program called the Grammy Jazz Ensembles. In fact, we've had uh, a couple of OSHA students who have been selected for the Grammy Jazz Ensembles. And uh, that particular year, we asked uh, we asked Esperanza to be our guest artist uh, for the jazz ensembles. And the jazz ensemble program brought together the best high school singers and players that we can find from across the United States. And um, hold on, let me silence my phone. So Esperanza said yes. And we were very happy that she said yes. And at the same time, her manager was pushing for her to have a performance segment on the Grammy telecast. And the CEO of the Recording Academy at the time said, well, she can have a performance on the Grammy telecast if she plays with some of the students from the Grammy Jazz Ensembles. And she said, sure, cool. So when we met her, the first time was at a rehearsal. The, the first time was a rehearsal for the, the telecast. So we said, we're going to do the telecast rehearsal first. We'll get that tune out of the way, and then we'll start working on the things that we're going to do when you're playing with the actual jazz band kids and we go in the clubs and whatever. So when she walked in, uh, she said, hello. I said, hello. She says, you know, when I was in high school, I tried out for the Grammy band. And then I thought to myself, Oh, expletive, because I knew every female bass player that was ever in that program, because there weren't that many bass players in the program who, who, who made the Grammy band. 
and I knew she wasn't one of them. So I didn't know what she was going to say after that. And, th and what she said after that was, and I did not make it. And I says, yeah, I know you didn't make it because if you had, I'd certainly remember you. She says, you know what I did? I said, what did you do? She says, I used that as incentive to get better. So that's one of the coolest things that anyone could ever say. And, and, and just the absolute right right idea of, you know, about stuff. She had, she had, of course, this youthful exuberance. She's an amazing singer. She's an amazing player. And she was just cool to work with. It was very, very good to work with. Uh, and by the way, she did win the Grammy for Best New Artist that year. She did. <laughs> she beat, you guys remember who she beat out? I don't remember. Who did she beat out? Justin Bieber. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, and uh, yes, when, when that category was announced, we were actually underneath the stage waiting to go on stage to do her performance segment. So yeah, that was, yeah, it was, it was very cool. Wow. Yeah, that hit me hard. I was in a meeting earlier today and they talk about, you know, failing, like again, her not getting accepted into this. Failing is just a first attempt in learning, right? It was like sure. she used that as an opportunity to like, okay, great. This door is closed, but I'm going to make sure that I get better. And then look what happened. She won a Grammy. It's amazing. Yeah, she won. And, and that's, um, there's another young bass player who went to Grammy camp named India Owens. And India Owens went to the Detroit School of the Art in, obviously, in Detroit. Uh, and the reason I thought of her is because I saw her on the YouTube channel the other day. India was a bassist. She did not have an electric bass uh, and, you know, her family was not really well off, but they were, you know, supportive of her the best they could. And India tried out for Grammy camp and uh, she actually had to borrow a bass to do her audition. She got accepted to Grammy camp and her dad was so impressed with that. Her dad said, look, you got accepted to Grammy camp. So I'm going to buy you an electric bass bought her an electric bass. I'll tell you, she wasn't the world's greatest bass player, but you know, she, she, had, she had something that you know, our, our faculty and, and, and my staff and I saw that we liked and we invited her to come to Grammy camp. She later went, you know, she graduated from high school. She went to, I think she went, uh, she went to uh, Michigan State, went to Michigan State University. And now she's the bass player in the uh, late show with Stephen Colbert band. Wow. Yeah. And the band leader of that band is uh, John Batiste, yep. who was in the Grammy band when he was in high school. So what goes around comes around. And one of his saxophone players, Emmanuel Wilkins, who was also in the Grammy band. So they all know each other and they all call each other for gigs. That's, that's kind of how it works, guys. You know, no one does it alone amazing well hey i'm gonna pin um another senior annalise uh bancroft she's a current sing uh, senior amazing composer actually um she loves composing for films and um she's taken her class a few times and also an incredible pianist annalise what did you want to ask mr sears Hello, Mr. Sears. I'm so thankful that you could come today. Um, my question is, what is one common mistake um, that you often see in younger students? And how would you advise students to overcome or avoid this? Uh, a common mistake that I see in students, ooh, one common mistake. Um, I guess the most common mistake they make is 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 not always being honest with their own ability abilities and willingness to develop skills at a high enough level to attain success and that they don't get out of the i'm gonna phase enough and get into the truthful phase where you're you're, you're associating yourself with people who tell you what you need to hear instead of what you want to hear that's so that's and, and if, if you can avoid that, then you've got a good shot. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, next 
I'm trying to find her in my sea of Zoom. Uh, Charlotte, there she is. All right, let me pin Charlotte. This is another senior uh, vocalist in our conservatory. Charlotte, uh, what did you want to ask Mr. Sears? Hi, uh, I'm Charlotte. Thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. Um, my part, my question is kind of two parts. Uh, the first is, what is your favorite part of being an educator? And I'm a huge fan of Quincy Jones, so I wanted to find out everything you could possibly tell us about your experience. Okay, so you were breaking up a little bit, but I think, you know, you know what was my favorite part about being a music educator? And uh, you wanted to hear stuff about Quincy Jones. All yeah. right. <laughs> um, I generally don't do, I, I generally don't say what my favorite of anything is because there's so many things that I like, but in terms of my favorite part about being an educator, that's, that's an easy one. It's working with students. You know, everything else is second to that. You know, what, working with students, you know, work, it, working with colleagues is cool, but it's not the same. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, if, if you're not really excited about working with students, then you shouldn't be an educator. It's, it's, it, that's, that's my opinion on that. Now, Quincy, um, Quincy Jones, I mean, he's, Quincy Jones is a legend and uh, I have never worked with Quincy as a musician where I was playing for him. I have had the opportunity to, to, to of course meet him. Uh, we honored him one year in one of our fundraiser things. And so I got a chance to work with him with regards to putting that together. Uh, Quincy, and I, of course I've been to several events where Quincy was speaking. Quincy is one of these guys who, if you just ask him a question, like if you ask him, you know, what his life was like, he will, you just need to sit back and listen. And he will just, because he, he'll he's, he's kind of like, a, he's an open book. He'll tell you all the stuff he was into. He'll tell you about all these great stories. You know, he, if, if you ever get a chance to meet him, ask him to tell you the story about how he and Leonard Bernstein were hanging out at, at um, uh, in, in Rome, laying on the floor in the, in the Sistine Chapel. Was that the, where, the, where the, the mural is? You know, laying on the floor looking at it. So that's a great story. I'm not going to say it because I can't say it the way Quincy says it. So, uh, but yeah, good guy, obviously a, a, a musical genius, but also Quincy is a marketing genius and Quincy could see things that were coming like that, that, that other people hadn't thought of. And then when he did it, they said, oh yeah, I should have thought of that. For example, um, the first person to use a lot of synthesizers in writing music for TV was Quincy Jones. There was a TV show called The Streets of San Francisco. Quincy Jones wrote the theme for that TV show and it used synthesizers. Now synthesizers had been around for quite some time. Synthesizers were around when I was in college and that was in the 60s. So, um, so he could think about things. So if you look at his resume, you can see, okay, he was the first to do this. He was the first to do this. You know, Quincy Jones is a jazz musician, but he never locked himself into just doing jazz. Uh, and, and he knew how to get along with people and to motivate people to do certain things and to deal with, and to deal with huge egos. Um, hey, we are the world. I, you know, I don't know that there is another producer who could have pulled that off in the amount of time that they, because they did the whole session in, in, in one night after a Grammy telecast. I don't know if there's another person who could have pulled that off other than Quincy. And it's not that these people with huge egos, they, they aren't, I mean, they're still nice people, but you got a bunch of people who are, you know, alpha personalities in the same room and to get all of them to say, okay, you need to put all of that down and now we need to sing like a choir not like a bunch of individual people. 
Quincy Jones could do that with folks. Awesome. Yeah. Um, thank Dar you. Darian, are you there with us? Hi, yeah. Wonderful. I'm going to um, I'm going to pin you real quick. Um, would you like to ask Mr. Sears your question? Yeah, absolutely. So um, my question is pretty general question, but what do you think makes a great songwriter? <laughs> you got me. I was going to say, uh, I, I warned you, David. I was going to say, we got a lot of aspiring songwriters. Uh, I love that question, but you know, you know, I, you know, look, I don't know. Um, look, it's, it, it's, 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 I write songs backwards. Um, so I never encourage anybody to write songs like me. I hear the groove and the chord changes before I hear the melody. And I almost never hear the lyrics, which is why if I'm writing, I try to write with a lyricist. Um, but what makes a good songwriter, was it a good songwriter or a good song? Oh, that's tough. Um, <laughs> I was gonna say, it sounds like it could be both now if you wanna answer both questions. I would yeah, it, yeah it, 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 in terms of song, it frankly, it, it's, it's, it's all subjective, but what people will say makes a good song is you know the lyrics and the fact that other people want to hear or perform that song many, many years later and over and over and over again. But that's not the only reason because there are some songs that I think are great songs, but they were performed in such a way that, you know, nobody else will touch them because they don't say, you know, I could, I could never do rock steady like Aretha Franklin did rock steady. So I'm not gonna try to do rock steady, you know, that type of thing. So it's, 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 and it's, it's incredibly subjective. It's, it's what, it's what the audience thinks is good. Now, that's not the only answer either, because you might write a song that never becomes a hit. And if you think it's a great song, as far as I'm concerned, it's a great song. I know that doesn't help much, but. No, I love it. Thank yeah. you so much for that. So good. We have another senior. I'm going to pin him here. Thomas Lowry, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Perfect. Thomas, uh, you had a very specific question that you wanted to ask. Five toes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, my question was just uh, in general of your opinion. But uh, what I wrote was from working with straight ahead rock artists like the Foo Fighters to working with laid, laid back soul legends like the Temptations, what's the biggest difference you'd say between the two as far as a, the working environment or behind the scenes or in front of an audience? Well, that, that's hard to answer, particularly with regards to those two, because what I did with each of those was very different. Uh, with, the, with the Foo Fighters, I was working with them for the 50th Grammy telecast. And the only reason I can remember is the 50th Grammy telecast is because somebody told me a couple of weeks ago that that's what it was. Uh, First, they were both really good to work with. Uh, the, my, but my roles were very different. My roles with the Foo Fighters was, what, what they originally wanted me to do was put together the orchestra that was going to back, uh, to back up the band. And because they wanted a student orchestra, that's why, okay, David, you're the education guy, so you identify some students. So. I put together I put together the orchestra, and then when we went to the rehearsal, uh, they had the person uh, the person who did the arrangement did a great arrangement. They wanted him to conduct because because that was really, you know, they wanted him on camera, and so he couldn't just be on camera standing there while the Foo Fighters are playing. So they wanted him to conduct the orchestra, but he wasn't a great conductor, so he was a great bass player. So. Uh, they asked me, well, so we want you to teach him how to conduct and, you know, and then communicate when he talks to you about what he wants the orchestra to do, you communicate that to the orchestra in the way that the orchestra could understand. So that became my gig. And then when, and, and so for the first day of rehearsal, Foo Fighters weren't even there. That's what we did. The second day of rehearsal, 
uh, they came in and they were just like regular guys. And it was, um, he said, okay, you know, what's it sound like? I says, okay, let's listen for yourself. They played it. And, you know, the bottom line, regardless of the kind of music we were playing, we we're all musicians here. And so musicians are about just, you know, making the music sound good. And, 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 uh, and if it sounds good, everybody's happy. If it doesn't sound good, then we say, let's figure out how we make it sound good. And then we figure out how we make it sound good. So in, in, in that regard, it's pretty much the same, you know, so it's not so much genre as, as it is just, you know, the personality. Uh, my role with The Temptations was very different in that I was the music director. So as the music director, uh, yeah, I was in charge for, you know, conducting the band and it was their tour in Europe, which also meant that we were also, we, we took a rhythm section with us on the road and then we would book horns and strings in every city that we were in. Well, I speak one language. I don't speak other languages. I did find out that I speak a little Italian because all of those terms that we use in music, uh, which I knew were Italian, but you never kind of believe it until you're in Italy speaking to an, you know, a guy in Italian and you say piano and he gets it. Oh, I get it, okay. So um, that, that was a different experience because a lot happened before the tour started. I came on board late. Uh, their music director resigned. They were looking for a music director. They had the tour already booked. They needed to get someone really quick. Uh, the person they wanted was not me. The person they wanted was a guy named Leslie Drayton because Leslie Drayton had just gotten off the road with being with um, Marvin Gaye for several years. So they wanted Leslie because they knew Leslie was a known quantity and Leslie was great at doing what he was doing. But Leslie didn't want to go on the road anymore. Leslie wanted to start his or well, continue his composition and, and um, publishing business and start his jazz band because Leslie's a jazzer at heart. But he says, I'll try to think of somebody for you. And he ran into another friend at the Musicians Union and that friend said, well, you're trying to think of someone who can you know, do arrangements if needed, work with a band and work with the vocals because the Temptations are a vocal group and they might need someone to work with the vocals. You know, you know anybody like that? They said, what about David Sears? And Leslie says, oh yeah, I should have thought of him before they called me and I got the gig. That's pretty much how it was. But my role was to work with this rhythm section that also had and needed a new drummer get them to jail, get all of them, you know, rehearse a, you know, rehearse a bunch of guys, a bunch of horns and strings who played, who, who spoke other languages and communicate with them in a way so that we can get the show done, take a two hour show and get the two hour show together in a one hour rehearsal. So, you know, <laughs> talking about putting 10 pounds of stuff in a five pound bag. That was the gig. So it was it was being a musician. It was sometimes being a um, uh, a referee between road managers and and other folks. To say nothing of the fact that one of the temptations, you know, had a tragic tragic thing happen to him, and he couldn't go with us on the road, and we had to redo all the vocal parts and everything. And it was it was just a very very different experience. But it was it was. I learned a lot on that tour. Uh, I had told myself that I was never gonna go on tour again because I didn't, it wasn't for me. But when I had a chance to go out with them, I, I had to put that rule aside because those guys are my heroes growing up. But again, just people and nice people. So Absolutely. it wasn't about the genre, it's about the music. If everybody can do their job and everybody's cool. Cool, thank you. Sure. Love it. Yeji Kim, um, our next senior, has a question for you. Yeji? Yeah, hi. Um, so my question is, as a producer and engineer, what advice do you have for aspiring artists that are wanting to produce or co-produce? And how can they effectively build their skills to bring their songs to life and find their individual sound? Well, there's a question out of a book. OK. Uh, all right. Do you want to be a producer or are you the artist? Don't leave. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like as an artist who's like wanting to co-produce. You want to produce as well. So you want to produce your own stuff. You want to produce other people's stuff. Uh, own stuff. Okay. Well, th the answer is easy. To do it is difficult. 
but the answer is if you want to produce your own stuff, start producing your own stuff. Uh, the cool thing about today is the tools are available for you to do that at a price that's reasonable compared to when I was growing up and personal computers didn't even exist. So, um, you know, you, you get yourself a DAW. I mean, do you work, do you work in a, in a, in a, do you work in a DAW now? Do you work in Pro Tools or, or any, which one do you work in? Logic. In Logic. Okay. So you're, you're, you're an Apple person. Good, good for you. Okay. Sorry, Greg. Uh, Greg's a friend of mine, he's an executive at, at Abbott. <laughs> so, well, no, but um, look, it's um, get really good at logic. Uh, my philosophy is don't become a slave to the computer. Uh, and yes, it's good to be highly skilled, but music is always, and regardless of the kind of music it is, music is always always 100% about the feel, about the groove, regardless of, I mean, the reason we still play Mozart is because it made everyone feel good. So remember that and use the tools to create that feeling and don't use the tool as a shortcut to learning the nuts and bolts of music. Okay, I, I hate these. I hate these apps where you can say, "Okay, pull out a chord change here, and you can drop this chord change in, and it sounds really good." I would rather you learn what the chord change is and then create it yourself, because that's going to serve you much more in the long run. Because if you get on the road with the Temptations or whoever, and they say, look, we have decided that we don't like this song that we're using for the middle of our show where we're introducing the band. We want you to write something. And you're sitting in your hotel room and you have no piano. And like an idiot, I did not take my horn with me on the road because I was the music director. I'm doing this with my arms. Uh, and you have to write something and you don't have the computer and you don't have all those little chords and little things and you have to sit down with a pencil and music paper and write out everybody's part. That's when you show your real worth and value. And when I was able to do that, we were in Manchester, England. When I was able to do that and pass it out to band and rehearse it, there, there is nothing like hearing the band play your music back. And the first time I heard it, that was coming into my ears instead of coming out of my head onto a paper was then there's, there's no feeling like that. So don't, the, 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 look, I have a computer. I'm surrounded by electronic stuff. Use it, but don't allow it. That, that's, that's the tail. I mean, you know, we're the dog. Don't let the tail wag us. And just do it over and over again, and 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 play, learn you know learn what learn what it is that makes the production sound good. Uh, one of my former students um, is one. I, I mean, I've got a lot of former students, but this one I bring up all the time. His name is Manny Marlquin. Manny Marlquin is one of the top mixing engineers in the country. I mean, you can get on satellite radio, they have whole stations that are just songs that Manny has mixed. So he's got multiple Grammys. I was fortunate enough to be allowed to take him his first two Grammys that he won. You know, so you learn, learn the tools and how to use those terms and it, those tools. It's, it's, and it's, they say there's real truth to it's not what you have, it's how you use it. So understand what compression really does. Understand what the different types of compressions do. Understand about EQ, understand all of that, but also make sure that you know the basics. Because if you know the basics, then what you produce will come out sounding good and it won't sound like the weekend sounded on the halftime show at the Super Bowl, which was a mess. There was too much reverb, there was too much 
there was there was too much reverb, there was too much delay, there was too much everything, there was not enough of this, it was too much band, not enough of him. Somebody should have told him you need to learn how to dance and move before you put yourself in front of millions of people on TV, all of that. So I had to get that halftime show in there, it was terrible. And it didn't have to be. I, I was gonna say, I will say though, cause I'm, I'm biased. Uh, Mr. Fletcher is one of our teachers. He's actually with us right now. He helped do the background vocals for the halftime show for the weekend. And I, so I thought the background vocals sounded amazing. So, so good. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is the, the, the problem was it, that I saw was, was the overall production. The, 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 the audio engineering, you know, with all due respects to whoever was or were the engineers on that show didn't do a great job. No, agreed, yeah. They, they, they didn't do a great job. And, uh, and I happen to know that the top guys in the field of audio engineering for TV, the top guys in this country were not on that show because I know somebody who knows all the top guys and is one of the top guys and they were all working shows here. So maybe that was why there, there, there was a problem, but all of that stuff was in Pro Tools. I mean, it was like hit play. That, that should have been fixed in this, you know, they should have taken those tracks to yeah. a recording studio and said, mix this stuff, make it sound good. And then all we're going to do is hit play. But I don't know what they did, but it, 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 it didn't work. It didn't work. I mean, everything was in tune and all that kind of stuff, but the production value wasn't, wasn't great. Yeah. Anyway, so no, there we not, go. No, so good. Learn the tools. Learn the tools. Learn the tools. Yeah. Well, hey, uh, we have our next question from senior Jonah Lee. Jonah, are you with us? Hello. Are there any juniors and sophomores and freshmen with questions? Yeah. Hey, Jonah. Yeah. I wanted, yeah, I wanted to highlight our seniors. Um, okay. Our All right. Here with us, but um, I figured in like. Five, 10 minutes, I'm going to open it up for people okay. to ask questions in the Zoom chat too. So go ahead, Jonah. Uh, yeah, my question was, what do you think makes a certain practice routine or technique or method? I'm sorry, say that again. Oh, sorry. Um, what makes a practice, certain practice routine or technique more helpful than others? Mine more helpful than others? Uh, what would you say makes like one? Yeah, my, mine is helpful to me because it's me. See, I, I know, I, so it's important to know who you are. Uh, now, I told you earlier when I was in college, I, you, know, I, I, you know, to catch up with the other guys, I practice four or five hours every single day. Uh, if you ask me today if I practice four or five hours every single day, no, there's no way. Um, I don't do that because one, I have a full-time job and I don't have time to do that. But what works for me works for me, but that doesn't mean it's going to work for you or someone else. I mean, the basics are, the basics are there is that you have to practice intentionally and the basics are you should play. And if you're a player or a singer, you should practice every single day. Because if, if you're, if you're, if, if you play an instrument, what do you play? What do you play? I'm a bassist. You are a bassist, electric, upright, or both. Electric. Okay, then you should play every single day because a lot of what you're doing is music memory. I mean, it's muscle memory. And, and I could connect to that because remember I was an athlete growing up and you know, you work out every single day. I mean, you work out when the off season so that your muscles do what you want them to do when you want them to do it. So Playing the bass is, is no different, is no different. Playing any instrument is no different, it's physical. And so you need to practice that. And have you ever heard the term use it or lose it? Yeah. Okay, well, that's true. You, you know, use it or lose it. Young people don't generally get it because you guys are young. And so, you know, you haven't been on the planet that long but is practicing every day. It is better to practice 30 minutes every single day than to practice two hours every other day. 
Um, Cause you're just teaching your muscles what to do. And you're also teaching that muscle inside your head, the brain, what to do and play all kinds of styles, play all kinds of styles. So, you know, I've also been fortunate. I've been around a lot of really, I think in another life I was a bass player cause I just loved the bass so much. Um, and my, the, the first really amazing student that I had when I first started teaching was a bass player or was he? No, the, maybe, he, maybe he was second or third because I had this piano player that was pretty cool named Jody Yapkowitz who became a computer engineer of all things, but a great piano player too. Uh, but uh, no, JJ uh, Wiggins is the bass player I was thinking of years and years and years ago. Uh, amazing ears, just amazing. He could hear, he could hear things that you wouldn't believe. Uh, and great player, but he was a great player beyond his years because he practiced all the time and he had a practice regimen that was good for him. He graduated from high school and before the summer was over, he was playing bass in the Duke Ellington Orchestra. So, um, you know, and a lot, it was skill. A lot of that was talent too, because he was just kind of more talented than everybody. But talent without skill means nothing. Remember that. And so uh, you, you have to develop your own regimen. The only thing I can say that should be that, that, that's general and specific to everyone is practice every day. You know, get on your instrument every day. You know, if you can only get on it for five minutes, that's better than no minutes. Thank you. Okay. Love it. So I have one more senior. I'm looking at all the questions the seniors had admitted and a lot of them you've already answered their question, but I have one more question uh, from Celine. And then I know a lot of our students want to open up the floor and ask questions specifically about Grammy camp. So maybe we can end the day with that. But Celine, are you with us? Hello. Hey, do you want to add, uh, ask your question? Yes. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be laggy, so I'll um give you the question in the chat. But should I your opinion on the comparison between Taylor's? 1989 album and Kendrick Lamar's Pimp a Butterfly um, during the 2016 Grammy Awards. The 2016 Grammy Awards. Yeah, I'm going to help her out. There was a little bit of some lag. No, I, I read it. I, I, okay, I, perfect. I was able to see it. I, I, I read it. Uh, I don't tend to make those kinds of comparisons. And, and secondly, just because I worked at a, for the Grammys and because I'm a member of the Academy, it doesn't mean I get to, th that I go to the show. <laughs> I mean, I'm there and I'm usually working. So, I, I, and if I'm working, I'm probably not in the bowl watching the show. Uh, last year, I actually watched a large portion of the show. So I'm going to, I'm going, I'm going to respectfully pass on making a comparison between one artist's album versus another artist's album. Um, you know, it's, you know, and, and frankly, I am, those are not albums that I can bring up to the top of my brain right now to even talk about. I mean, if I would talk, I could talk about them from a production standpoint, if I could bring them up in the top of my brain now, but I can't. So I'm going to have to pass on that. I'll get back to you, Celine. Awesome, no problem. Okay. okay. We wanted to end the day. Um, a lot of our students have uh, been a part of Grammy Camp before. I know Albert Bushala um, was you know, the one that helped us connect with you and um, him and both his sister have been involved as well as some of our current students and past students in this program. So um, what advice would you give about applying for Grammy Camp um, things that you would look for during the application process. 
um, uh, you know, big no-nos to watch out for. Don't do this in your audition video. Any advice you want to give? Uh, yes. Um, and uh, if you have any other questions about Grammy Camp, you can always email me. I'm david at grammy.com. Or if you have questions about anything else, just say, you know, you, you go to OSHA and you have another question. It might take me a while to get to it because we've got Grammy week coming up and we've got a gazillion things going on. But, you know, send me an email and I'll, I'll get back to you. All right. So first, the thing to do, the first thing to do to give yourself the best shot at having it being accepted to Grammy camp is to apply. You have no shot if you don't apply. So, I mean, that sounds obvious, but you'd be, you'd be surprised how many people say, well, I didn't think I could make it, so I didn't apply. And, you know, if, if, if that kid, India Owens, that I referred to from Detroit earlier, who's now playing with uh, the Late Show Band, she was a little reticent about applying. You know, she was, she was already shy. She knew she wasn't the world's greatest bass player, and she wasn't. And I used to tell him, you don't have to be the world's greatest bass player. You just have to be a bass player that's good enough for, compared to the ones, other ones who apply. And so uh, give it a shot. So it's, it's you know, a no-no is for you or your parents to spend a gazillion dollars overproducing a video. Overproduced videos do not add additional benefit or additional chance to you getting accepted to Grammy camp. Uh, secondly, what is Grammy camp about? Grammy camp, first I'm gonna tell you what it's not about. Grammy camp is not a music camp. Grammy camp is a music industry camp. Grammy camp is about you beginning to actually build a plan or a uh, work on your plan that you've already started to give you the best chance at having a successful career in music. Now, are we going to talk about building musical skills if you're a performer or building songwriting skills if you're a songwriter? Absolutely. Uh, is there an advantage of going to Grammy camp if, for example, you want to go to the University of Southern California or if you wanna to go to you know, any place else? Absolutely, it's, it, it, there's, there's a benefit there. But if your reason for coming to Grammy Cramp, Grammy, <laughs> Gammy Cramp, which I used to say all the time, uh, to, to Grammy Camp is to just become a better singer, that's, it's not for you. Uh, we want students who want to become a better singer, for example, but they also want to know how they can make a career as a singer. Because that's where most of our emphasis is going to be. Uh, because and the reason we, we design camp that way is because there are already a lot of great camps that focus on making you a better performer. There's tons of them. So we didn't want to be a ton of them plus one. We wanted to be something that was a little bit different. And so that's why we do that. That's why we have multiple tracks. That's why we get them interacting with each other and that type of thing. Love it. Um, does anyone have a specific question? Gray, are you in the room? I know you had a question to ask. Um, it was quite similar to just the starting question that you brought up with him, so I'm good. Perfect. Yeah. Anyone else in the room have um, a question that you'd like to ask specifically about Grammy Camp? Maybe something else that hasn't been discussed? Yeah, free to Grammy Camp or anything else. Yeah. I mean, get your application in by March the 31st. That's, that's the main thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, feel free to raise your hand in the Zoom chat if you have a question. Okay. Oh, um, Mr. Jacobs, you have a question. Uh, David, thanks uh, for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to hear you speak, and I'm glad that we're being uh, get, grabbing all this time to be exposed to the knowledge you have. The, the one topic that you brought up that I thought that was really important was about networking. And my question for you is, what kind of advice can we give our students who are don't know how to network or they're too shy to network? Because I went through that myself as a professional musician. I was not good at networking. I wasn't good at the jam sessions going up to people going, hey, nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. And I know there's a lot of shy people in this school and, and, and maybe the, 
would like to get some advice in that area. Sure. Uh, I was also shy. My children don't believe that I was quiet when I was in high school because ever since they've been here, I've been kind of noisy, as you can see. Uh, but you want to know the bottom line. If you're shy and you don't reach out and you don't talk to people, you have less of a chance of being successful in this business. That's just that's just the way it is. And you know what? If you do that, you'll have less of a chance of being successful in almost any business. So like what you had to do, like what I had to do, we have to kind of find a way to get past that, get past that shyness and, and get past that nervousness. Look, the nervousness will not go away. You know, I am, I am, I'm an old guy now and I still get nervous about stuff. And so I find, I try to find ways to help me do what I need to do despite the nervousness. Uh, when I was when I was going back to college, I would get this horrible stomach ache. We, we had to play juries in, in those days. And so it was like a little mini recital that you had to play, you know, like twice a semester. Um, and every time we would play a recital or a jury, I would be as nervous as a cat. I'd have this horrible stomach ache. And then I found a way to be able to perform to the best that I could, even with the stomach ache. Um, and in fact, after I was in school for a couple of years, you know, I remember I was going to do a jury and I didn't have a stomach ache. And I said, oh, this is going to be cool. I didn't have, I don't have a stomach ache. I went out and I totally screwed it. So then I was worried if I didn't get a stomach ache, if I would get a stomach ache. So it was just, you, you have to learn, you have to push past that. Because like I said, you, it's, 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 it's almost impossible to be successful in this business all by yourself without having a network of people. And if you have a friend, that's your network. You've already started. Figure out how you got that friend and then go get another one. Because a lot of people think, well, if to be successful in the music business, what I have to do is I have to be introduced to Manny Marquin or Quincy Jones or Ricky Minor. Now, the reason, I'm not going to use Manny as an example because Manny was one of my students. So, you know, we had a relationship from when he was in high school. But, um, but Ricky Minor and I, now, if, for those of you who don't know who Ricky Minor is, um, Ricky Minor is the former music director for Whitney Houston. Everybody talks about Whitney Houston's rendition of the national anthem during the Super Bowl 100 years ago. That was Ricky Minor's vision. Ricky Minor has since, he's, he's the music director for the Grammys, he's the music director for the Oscars. Uh, he was the music director. He won an Emmy for being the music director of the Kennedy Center Honors, the one where you know Aretha Franklin came out in, in the mink coat and took the mink coat and off and threw it on the floor and, and played uh, uh, You Make Me Feel Like a Wonderful. Yeah, that was oh, that was amazing. So Ricky Minor is a big deal. Ricky Minor was the music director for the Tonight Show with Jay Leno for the last four or five years that Leno was on air. So Ricky Minor is a big deal. Why does Ricky Minor accept my calls and text messages? Because Ricky and Minor and I played in the same rhythm section when we were just a bass player and a keyboard player playing in a rhythm section in a, in a, in a, in a local band here in Los Angeles. So what is all of that to say? Start making your network right where you're sitting in your, in, your, in your classroom there, those friends that you have at OSHA are going to be helpful to you or they may be helpful to you and you may be helpful to them five, six, seven, eight years from now. When Ricky and I were playing together in, in David I's Love Eye Orchestra, I didn't know that he was going to be the Ricky Minor. You know, I had already I had already been on the road with a bunch of people, but I wasn't quote unquote. I, I certainly was not working for the Grammys. I was a member, but nobody cared about that. So, 
the, the point is we, we kept, by that time I had learned when you, when you meet these people and form a relationship with these people, just keep in touch with them. You don't have to, and, 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 and keep in touch with them just you know, to talk, to hang out, necessar- not necessarily to ask them for something because the best partnerships are the ones where both people bring something to the partnership. That's why I don't advocate when a high school student says, can you introduce me to Quincy so that I can do a project with Quincy? Well, if I had a type of relationship with Quincy where I could call him up and do a project with Quincy, I would do it myself. I'm not gonna give it to you, frankly. But we said, what do you bring to Quincy that Quincy thinks is valuable? You know, so ask yourself, what do I bring to the person sitting next to me that he or she thinks is valuable? We had a young lady who wanted to know about being a better producer. Is there somebody in on this Zoom who is amazing with, with producing? The two of you get together and do something. That's, 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 how, that's how it works. That's how relationships are started. It's very rarely someone who's a superstar way up here and somebody who's down here who, who is still trying to make it. Thank you. Sure, thank you. I really appreciate that question. I hope, I hope that was helpful. That was a wonderful question. Anyone else? Have Come on, I know any- you got, some of you guys have questions that you don't want to ask. And, and you see, you know, Celine asked me a question and it wasn't one that I felt that I could answer and nobody's upset, nobody passed out, you know, <laughs> no one became, you know, the, you know, the wicked witch of the West, we threw some water on her and they, and they melted. Yeah. Well, hey, it looks like we have a student here. I'm going to pin him. Jack, are you with us? <laughs> yeah, I am. I love that orange, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I uh, can't even remember where I found it now. Um, but so I've been kind of asking this question to everybody I can, trying to kind of compare answers and things. So you've worked with like everybody. You've seen a lot of students. You've seen, you know, you've been around a long time. You under, you get it. What do you see that sets people apart? Like, what is it that when you hear it, when you see it, like from a student maybe, or from somebody that you're working with that like, you know that they're gonna be successful or they're gonna have something that they, somebody else doesn't have? You know what, you don't always know. <laughs> um, I'll tell you, when I was teaching, uh, I taught for 23 years and I, I, I can count on one hand the number of students that I thought when they were there in high school, this kid's got it, this kid's gonna make it, period, end of story. Uh, you kind of never know until you know, for, for the most part. I mean, no one would have thought when I was in high school that I would have the kind of success that I was gonna have. Look, when I, when I was, you know, I told you I was offered, you know, this baseball contract when I was in the 11th grade, I wasn't even playing varsity baseball on my high school team. I was playing, I was playing junior varsity baseball and didn't start every game. In fact, I didn't suit up in every game, but I was also playing elsewhere in, in, in semi-pro leagues and in muni leagues and things like that. And that's where I got looked at. But um, I, th- there's a drummer named Abraham Laboreal Jr. Uh, he plays with his dad, Abraham Laborio Sr., one of the best bass players in the history of electric bass players. But he plays for Paul McCartney. He's Paul McCartney's drummer. And Abe was, Abe was one of my students. He was, Abe was the first person I auditioned the first year that we opened up the Music Academy in Hamilton. Abe walked in the room and I said, what's your name? And he said, my name's Abraham Laboreal Jr. Well, I was very familiar with his dad, but I didn't get overly, ex- overly excited because I have had the sons of really great players before and they weren't necessarily all that great. So Abe played and after Abe played for about maybe 20 seconds, my thought was two things. One, unless this kid self-destructs, he is going to make it in the music business. 
He's nice. He's got a, he's, he, he, he wants to try new things. And he's got a thing when he plays, this indescribable thing that makes you feel good, makes you, quote unquote, as David, I used to say, makes your body move when the music, when you play the music. It, it's, it's going to happen for him unless he self, plus he had the lineage because his dad was, you know, one of the world's great bass players. So, uh, and he was extremely humble. So after, list, after talking to him for two or three minutes and then listening to play for those 20 seconds, I knew, that was it. Now, was he our best drummer that first year? He was not our best drummer, but he was the only drummer we had who I said, he's going to make it. Another drummer, Willie Jones. Willie Jones III. Willie Jones III was one of my students when I was teaching at the regular high school, I was teaching at Los Angeles High. And Willie was a good drummer. And when Willie graduated, one of the things I told him was, you know what, if you keep going on on this path, you're going to be fine. If you know, because he said he wanted to be a musician. So if you keep on this path, you're not there now, but if you keep going, you're going to be fine. He and I lost touch for maybe three or four years after that. After that, he's, he's one of the top jazz drummers on the East Coast now. I mean, then, I mean, and has been for many years. So, you, you, I'm saying is you, you don't always know uh, in terms of being a professional. Again, it goes to the feel. Um, who makes you feel good when they play might not make might not be who makes me feel good and vice versa. You just you just never know. Uh, I mentioned this guy David I. Uh, he's passed on now, but David I was Smokey Robinson's. Uh, saxophone player when he was on the road and David wanted to have a big band and he had a big band well I'm not a jazz player uh, you know I grew up in you know I grew up listening to Motown and Atlantic and you know R&B and pop and and then when I went to college I listened to a lot of country and all and and, and I was of course classically trained so so I, I was into that but I was not a jazz player a, as it were and particularly on keyboards I, you know I, I'm a trombone player but I sit at the keyboard and I mess around on the keyboard. But I was playing a lot of keyboard gigs, playing pop music and stuff like that. David and I asked me to play in his band. I was very excited to play in David's band because he had this band of guys who had been sidemen or musicians in a bunch of other really good bands. Uh, so he said, I want you to play in the band. So I said, oh man, I'm excited. This is great. Yeah, I grabbed my horn was going to the rehearsal and I was very excited because the first, the, the lead trombone player in his band was a man named Fred Wesley. Now, many of you may not have heard of Fred Wesley, but you probably have heard of George Clinton and the P-Funk All-Stars or Parliament Funkadelic. Um, yeah. And Fred Wesley, and when you hear James Brown records and he says, Fred, and James, and you hear a trombone solo, that's Fred Wesley. So I was excited to be able to play in the same section with Fred Wesley. I get to the rehearsal, it was at the Musicians Union, I remember in Hollywood, and David was pulling up at about the same time. I get out of my van, I pull my trombone out of my van, David looks at me and he says, where are you going? I said, well, you told me that, you know, that you wanted me to play in your band and you had a chair for me in the band and so I'm going to the rehearsal. He says, no, I want you to play keyboards. I don't want you to play trombone. Well, he already had a, he had a keyboard player with, who was a great jazz player. I said, man, I'm not a jazz piano player. He says, don't worry about that. I want you to play in my band because when you play, you make my body move. Those are his exact words. And that's why I've been saying that ever since. You know, it's, it's about the feeling. The way I played, for some reason, it resonated with him. And, and, so I ended up playing keyboards in his band for five, six, seven years. You never know. You, you just, you know, you, you don't know it, but, it, but in terms of professional, it's who makes you feel good. You know, are they a nice person? That's the other thing, folks. No one likes to work with a grouch. I don't care how talented and how skilled you are. No one wants to work with a grouch. 
And the reason that those first two things, talent and skill doesn't matter, because I can find another guy who's just as talented and just as skilled, who is really nice to be around. <laughs> there you have it. Thank you so much. Yeah, being nice is really important. So Work good. at being happy. So good. Appreciate they don't call it play music for nothing. I mean, it's fun, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hey, it looks like we have one more question for the day. So I'm going to let Charlotte take over again. Charlotte, what question did you have? Um, hi, just real quick. I wanted to ask, what do you think your dream project or your dream collaboration would be? Hmm. I have lots of dreams. Um, my, I mean, you know, I've been in the business a long time. Uh, for me right now, uh, my dream, I won't say dream project, but, the, but well, I will say dream project, I'll just expand it, would be to be able to uh, write full time. I mean, I play every day anyway, but I don't play professionally anymore. Write full time. You know, I like, I love my job. Well, I like my job a lot, a lot. I love my children and I really love my grandchildren, um, but it would be able to, to write full time. And uh, cause that, you know, that brings me a lot of joy now and, and to hear my music being played or performed by, by other, by other groups that, that feels really good. I mean, that, I mean, a lot of stuff feels really good, but, you know, to hear your music coming back at you, it's, you know, being played by other people, there's kind of nothing like that. Um, so, um, so that, that, that would, that would be, that would be it for me. Um, now, I'm doing everything I want to do, not everything I want to do, but most of what I want to do now. But at some point, I am, you know, at some point, I'm going to, you know, retire from the Grammy Museum Foundation if they don't kick me out beforehand. Uh, but, uh, and because and, and, this is my last job, you know, it is, it, that, that is going to be my last job where, you know, you go and you go, you know, you have an eight hour gig. But I'm never going to retire from music because, you know, before this thing started, I was sitting at the piano thinking of Oscar Peterson and playing um, Hymn to Freedom that I was fortunate enough to do an arrangement for, for an event that we honored him at. Um, so, you know, there you go. Hope that answers your question. And I have five toes on each foot. <laughs> well, David, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, you have no idea, you know, uh, next month will be a year for us being virtual. Um, and, you know, being in this environment brings so many exciting yeah. challenges um, right. that we get to work around and be, you know, innovative and creative with. And it's experiences like this where we get to sit with someone like you um, that really just makes our whole month. So I just want to thank you for your time. Um, Albert Bushala, I know you're here. Thank you again to you, Albert, for helping us make this connection and make this uh, masterclass possible. Um, I do want to just say a couple of things, students. Um, the link for- can I, say, can I say one more yeah. thing? Go ahead. Okay. Um, first, you know, if you like this session, I mean, uh, I, the, your teachers should have gotten an email from us announcing Gets Fest or Grammy in the Schools Fest. It's going to be, 20 online 45 minute sessions that are Q&A and recorded performances with uh, multiple individuals uh, from music professionals like music educators, uh, music professionals uh, and artists. For example, uh, uh, Charlie Puth and Manny Marquin are doing a panel. They're closing it out for me. Uh, her is going to do a panel. Uh, we've got, uh, we have 10 faculty with Grammy Camp and we divided them up five and five and each one of them is going to do a panel. And this is all happening March the 8th 
through the 11th and teachers who register their students for this will get uh, study guides and lesson plans for each of the sessions and it cost is zero, it's free during Grammy week. The panels all begin at 2 p.m. and they go on the hour, every hour, two, three, four, five, and six. There's one panel that we're doing with John Batiste. Uh, we're doing it at noon because he has to be on the set of The Late Show at one. We're doing that at noon, hopefully on Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah, it's amazing. I actually just put in the chat um, to all of our staff members that I was going to be sharing that with them. But mm -hmm. the beauty is, is our classes start at two o'clock, David. So I'm like, man, it's just perfect that we're going to be able to to start conservatory and maybe, um, yeah, come yeah. into some of these pants. I know like her, Charlie Puth, I'm seeing a lot, a lot of people are direct messaging me right now. Like, please, Mrs. Kramer, let's go. So I know yeah. a lot of our students are gonna be really excited to be a part of that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be, I'm, I'm starting to get excited. There's a lot more logistical stuff we have to do. It's, there's a ton of things to do. And guys know that there's a lot of different careers inside of music, if you want to have a career in music and, you know, just, you know, and, that, and that's one of the things we'll be talking about, you know, check them out. I mean, for example, for every, there's probably going to be maybe 15 or 20 videos that we have to do. And each one of those videos has to be cleared. With the artists, we're playing, a lot, you, know, some, you know, a video from you know, one of their music videos. And for those, we have to clear it with the artist. We have to clear it with the publisher. We have to clear it with, clear it with the composer. We have to clear it with the record label. Fortunately, I don't have to do all that, but we have someone on staff who's working on all of those things, but that is a job for some people and some people really like that stuff. So there you go. There's an, there's an option for you. Love it. Yeah. We, I teach a music business class for all my, my seniors who are asking all the questions and we we're learning all about that, the different roles, you know, personal manager, sync licensing, like there's so many things that you could do um, besides right. being the artist, but being part of the creative team that helps the artists do what they do. Right. Yeah. a lot of people behind the scenes yep i love it well thank you so so okay. much